Today I'm joined by McMaster defensive coordinator Scott Brady. Really excited to talk today a bit about how he goes into a week and, and breaks down opponent and, and plans to get that information to his players. I think it's something that, you know, obviously all of us are going to have some time without a game to, to prepare for. And there's so much tough stuff being talked about with scheme right now, which is great. Um, but I think one of the things that coaches, especially maybe people that are transitioning from playing into coaching, you know, I know it was a big thing for me to learn as I, as I made that transition is how to prepare for an opponent um and and having a system for that so i appreciate you sharing that with us today coach and kind of if you could walk us through kind of how do you start breaking down an opponent and what are kind of the big picture things you know that you're looking at as as a defensive coordinator for sure thanks a lot for having me jackson i'll just uh pull up my presentation here for us kind of the starting point of our prep week is obviously inputting the data from the previous games and so when we're getting ready for an opponent, I, I think kind of the standard thing, if you look at like CFL or U sports teams in terms of how many games they rely on is they typically look at like the last three games that their opponents played. We'll do the same thing. So we'll use at least three games or the last three games from an opponent. Um, we'll make sure that everything's coded, you know, by the end of the previous week. The, the difference with us is we'll also include like any previous games against us. So we'll go back if they've had, a consistent offensive coordinator for the last couple of years. We'll also make sure that we break down the last couple of years um, of games against us. And then the other big one for us is we try to find, you know, one to two defenses in our league that have pretty similar defensive structures to what we do. Um, when we're putting in the data, like I, I'm a big believer, you want to input as much data as you possibly can on your opponent. We're not going to give that to all the players and, you know, even for some of the guys listening to this, if you're coaching high school or something, obviously it's, it's a lot of data that you go through. You don't need to do all of it. We won't use all the data or communicate all the data to the players. I like to have it and our coaches like to have it so that, you know, they can get as big a picture as possible of what our opponent's going to do. But really the stuff that we give to our players is a really, really small portion of that. And just the, the most important stuff that we want to take away. Um, you kind of have the data to rely on if you see something different or if something that was a smaller part of their game plan becomes a bigger part of that game plan in that specific game. So you've seen it before. Um, but even as we go through this and I show some examples from our scouting report, you'll see like some of the stuff is highlighted in yellow and that's really the stuff that we want our players to focus on. Um, I kind of talked about it earlier, but I, I do think it's important to understand at least at a base level, what the other defenses in your league are doing. And so one of the things we'll do in the off season is just go through and watch the other defenses in our league. And you're really just trying to understand like, what is their core philosophy? Like who are the 40 front teams, 30 front teams, you know, who likes to run their half back across, who likes the rock and roll, their half and free safety, who travels their Sam, who bumps their linebackers, you know, how, how much of a pressure team are they versus a base coverage team? And, Really what we're trying to get out of that is one, it's good professional development for us. But the bigger thing is when we get into the next season, you know, if you look at like a defense like Ottawa has some similarities to what we do. So that becomes a really good game for us to look at it. If we're playing Western or something and they played Ottawa, you know, four weeks ago, that may be more relevant to what we're going to see than if they play a team that plays a ton of man to man or runs their halfback across or tracks their Sam on the fullback, like they're going to get different looks than what we would typically see. So I, I think the, the games you want to give the most precedence to are the ones with similar schemes to what you see, because offenses are going to attack those structures in similar ways. Yeah. I think that's a huge point, especially for the summer football guys or, or high school guys that are trying to be efficient. Right. And everyone's access to film is different, but in general, if we're talking about, if you have access to film, you know, I found sometimes in summer ball, you might play, you know, a team that's running, you know, two fullbacks, like kind of diamond personnel. If you're a spread team, like you're not going to get like the data about the coverages they play to that three back look is only so helpful you know, to you as a, as say an offensive guy or defensive coach, you know, if you're playing like a 30 stack and moving all over the place, you're going to get different stuff than, you know, a team that's sitting in, you know, base 40 the whole time. I think that's a huge way to help with your efficiency because there's some games you want to watch as much as you can and, and go through as much data, like you said, as you can. But if you're in a time crunch or if you're, you know, an operation like in the summer or high school where, you might only have one or two coaches that are watching film on your staff. I think knowing 
you know, which games to find that mimic what you might see as a huge time saver. For sure. And I think obviously the, the, the biggest indicator is going to be recent uh, games against yourself. If you have those to rely on, which we don't frequently get in the OUA really until the playoffs. Um, but if you, you know, if you play a team a couple times during a season, that's going to be the biggest indicator of what you're going to get. But aside from that, if you can have another couple teams in your league that you think are relatively similar in structure to what you do, it, it helps you kind of cut to the chase a little bit quicker. Otherwise, you could waste a bunch of time saying, oh, they did this, you know, 25 times against this team. But that team's got a completely different structure than what you do. So you're not really going to see that. And it's the same thing with protections, run schemes, like some teams are going to like certain run schemes against the 30 front that maybe aren't as good against the 40. And you have to kind of whittle that away to get to the most likely set of circumstances that you're going to see. Um, so as, after we input the data and we start putting together a game plan, the very first thing that we want to look at is personnel. And so I think the key question we're trying to answer every single game right away is who are their best players. And, you know, the game planning is going to change a little bit week to week, but the starting point for us is always going to be who are their two, two to three best players and how can we take them away? And if you look at it from like the counterpoint to that, if you're going to lose a game, you want to lose it to their fifth or sixth best player, because if they can beat you with their fifth or sixth best player, I mean, they're probably better to, than you and kudos to them, but losing a game to their best guy you can't allow to happen so it's got to be how can we take away their two to three best guys that's going to change depending on who those guys are every single week um you know if it's a quarterback that's a big deal but when you start looking at like receivers and running backs now the big thing becomes are they going to be in a static place within the formation are they going to move them around within the formation those are big things to understand and especially if they've only got one or two guys who can hurt you that's one of the big tells that we'll kind of look for is generally if they're moving their best guy within the formation and he's typically in one spot and then he's elsewhere, they're doing it for a reason. And you want the guys to understand that. And one of the things that you're trying to answer as you go through the film, okay, this is where this guy typically is when they move him out of position, how are they trying to get him the ball, whether it's screen game or whatever the case is. So you really want to lock in on where their best players are going to be on the field. Um, you know, there's pros and cons to each. If they leave them in one spot, you know where that guy's going to be, but they probably have multiple ways to get him the ball out of that spot. The flip side of that is if they move him around a bunch, it's tough to know exactly where he's going to be, but they probably have more tendencies with what they do with that player when he's in that spot. So there, there's a give and take there that offenses have to deal with. Um, beyond their best players, big thing at, at the start of the week is figuring out what they do for personnel groupings. And, you know, some teams they're going to sit in two back or five are the whole game. Some teams are breaking down as many as five or six different personnel groupings. Like when we played you guys the last few years, you know, you're breaking down like six different personnel groupings that you're trying to see over the course of the game. You play Western, you're seeing one or two personnel groupings every single play. So it depends week to week, but you're trying to figure out like who's coming in, who's coming off the field um, when they sub personnel. And then the big question for us is, do we need to substitute when they do? And, you know, how, what are they going to do out of their two or three back stuff? Do we need to get bigger bodies on the field? Do we need to get extra defensive backs on the field when they go into their five R package? And you're trying to figure out, you know, what personnel groupings you need to get in to match up to theirs. Um, within each personnel grouping, you're really trying to figure out what they're trying to accomplish. And so they, a lot of it is pretty straightforward, but you know, if they bring extra offensive linemen or fullbacks in the game, most of the time they're doing it to run the ball or take deep shots off of play action. Um, but you do get some tendency breakers within that where teams will get into double tight to throw quick game and stuff like that. So you're trying to figure out what they're trying to do, you know, out of each personnel and then kind of what their constraints are within that. And then again, the big question for us is how do we match up in the box and on the perimeter? So the box is the big one. Um, you know, how do we hold up against their run game? Can we hold up against their run game? You know, playing even numbers in the box. Do we need to get an extra guy in there? Can we hold up, you know, light in the box and play too high so that we can help out over a better receiver? So you're trying to get a feel for how you're going to match up personnel wise in different parts of the field. 
I think quarterback and offensive line are really the two biggest positions to break down how you match up. And those are really the two that we'll spend the most amount of time on. Like we, we won't go crazy breaking down personnel tendencies for every position, but quarterback and offensive line, especially the center are really the two positions that we'll spend the most amount of time on trying to figure out our matchup. So quarterback, you're really just trying to figure out what that guy's skill set is. How does he respond to pressure? What's his mobility like? You know, how does he react to zone pressure, man pressure? Where does he like to escape the pocket if he's a runner, those type of things. Um, and if he is one of the better players on the field, you know, what's the thing that he's worst at and how can we force him to do that? And so, you know, if he's a great runner, really lucid, how can we make him stand in the pocket throw the ball to beat us or vice versa if they're not much of a runner. Um, for the offensive line, obviously you're generally looking at how good are they, how do we match up up front, but how do they handle blitz schemes, how do they handle overload schemes. The center's a big one, like I said, so how does that center specifically handle like double A gap pressure, having a nose tackle shaded on them or lined up in a zero? You know, does he have trouble snapping the ball? Does he have trouble getting a snap hand up? Like, the, the center is the position that you really want to lock in on because you can cause a lot of troubles with the exchange between the quarterback and center um, if you can dictate a good matchup inside there. And then the other thing that we'll do is we'll rank their offensive line one to five. And when you're drawing up, you know, blitz schemes, pressure schemes for a second and long, a lot of it is how can we get our one on their five and, and trying to dictate those matchups as much as you can. So these are just a couple examples from – you know, various scouting reports that we used over the last couple of years. I think this was from the Windsor game from this past year. So these were really the three big personnel groupings that we broke down. Um, how much they're in each personnel grouping over the course of the games that we looked at. And then the big one here, like I talked about, like we kind of identified that 12 and 13 were their two guys that we needed to pay attention to. And so we wanted to make sure that our guys knew where they were going to be within the formation. So right away when you see this, you know, if they're in their two back or five R, which is most of the game, that their kind of home position is to have those two as the, the slot and the wide out to the boundary. So already you're starting to think like we're going to get into some coverages that kind of push the strength into the boundary side of the formation to take away those best guys. Uh, and then tied into that, you know, this would be kind of a summary of, what formations they get into and then what types of plays they like to run out of each formation. Like I said, we try to highlight the relevant stuff for the guys. And so they don't need to know all of it. Guys are different and some guys like having as much information as they possibly can. And then there's a group of guys who are like, just tell me what I need to know. And so we try to cater to both sides of that. And so the, the stuff that's highlighted, it really gives the most important points. So like, couple things that would stand out if you're looking at this, like if they're in their three BL personnel, which for us is three back with the sixth offensive lineman is one of the fullbacks. Well, two thirds of the time they're going to be in a 21 double tight set and, you know, nearly 60% of their plays out of that personnel are just inside or outside zone. So now when we're looking at them getting into that personnel, you're going to see a heavy dose of inside outside zone. So you know, what are our best answers for that? What calls do we want to be in to take that away? If they're in their 5R personnel, you know, uh, over 50% of their plays are just six-man drop back pass. So, okay, the, these are the plays that we want to um, try to pressure against. And it gives you a – starts to give you a, a, a picture of what the personality of the offense is going to be out of each personnel grouping. Yeah, I think that that concept of, you know, a I think that I've and I've had this tendency too as as a guy who coaches a lot on offense and, and, but has done a lot of defensive stuff in the summer. You think about plays more than you think about players sometimes like oh like, you know, you recognize oh they're running this concept, you know, we play London all the time, you know, they're like oh they're running this play the western runs, how are we going to defend it? Right? And I think the best game plans that I've been a part of have always been about okay, like where out of what personnel set are they getting the, and how are they getting the ball to their best player, like out of that set. So it's, it becomes less about like, Oh yeah, they're running power. They're running this. It's in, okay. If they're in this set, we're going to get a B or C and a and B are the ones I really want to deal with. Cause that's how they're going to get the ball to their best player. And then if they beat us with C, they beat us with C, you know? And I think that that, that concept has helped me at least as a, as a defensive coach in the summer with high school guys or summer league players, really tailor down, okay, 
we have all this information, which is great and valuable. And like you said, even in high school, like I've had some kids, you know, that are in grade 11 that want as much information as you can give them. And I've, I've had some kids that are, you know, hey, what do I need to know to be successful that week? And I think for anyone who's watching that's going, hey, this is awesome. But, you know, I've got four hours of my time that I can do this on a Sunday. Like, what should I be looking at? If you do that breakdown of not just, okay, what personnels or formations do they run, but where are their best players? I think that's a great way to kind of start your conversation with, with your coaches about, hey, what should we be doing? you know, in response to that. For sure. And I think even just as a general philosophy, like I made this mistake uh, earlier on when I started coaching is you get so locked into, you know, trying to beat the other coordinator almost. And it, it's not really about that. It's, it's really what is the quarterback good at. And so they may even have good calls called for your pressures but if the quarterback isn't good at handling pressure and doesn't understand where the ball's supposed to go, even if they have a good play called, you know, you, you should still do it. it. It really is more about beating the quarterback or beating the offensive line than beating the opposing play caller. Um, and, and so I, I do think, like you said, it's players, not plays who are their best guys that we absolutely need to take away at all costs. And then who are their worst guys that we can get our best guys matched up on um, and, and give ourselves a, a really good chance to win. Um, once we get through the personnel, you know, and, and further kind of developing the idea of what's their personality on offense, we'll look at their core runs and passes. And so as a rough guideline, we'll break down the top four to five runs and the top eight to 10 passes every single week. We'll look at everything that they've done, but for the most part, we're locked in on those kind of core plays. Like offense is the good ones, and I think this is an important point when you start talking about tendencies. The best offenses that I've seen or coached against are not the ones that have the fewest tendencies. In a lot of cases, they're ones where you had a pretty good idea of what you were going to see. They were just better at it than everybody else. And, and so I think you can get too locked into, um, you know, not trying to have any tendencies. I don't think that's a good thing. You want to have tendencies because it means you've got an identity um, you just have to have enough in your package to kind of protect that. But like for us, for preparation, we try to focus on four to five runs, eight to 10 passes. Those are kind of the core concepts you're going to see. And then the good offenses, I think what they do a good job of is they're going to find um, new ways to dress up those core concepts every single week. If you see an offense that is changing concepts every single week, they're usually not very good but the good ones do a really good job of, okay, this, we love this pass concept on second and long. What's a different way that we can present this to the defense that they haven't seen. That's let, going to let us run, you know, this same play that we've practiced a lot and got really good at and also features our best guys. Um, so that's what we spend most of our practice time on. We'll mix in a few. Um, and we probably do 80% of our practice time on core plays and then 20% on, you know, specific beaters that we think we're going to see. So like if you're a quarters coverage team, you're trying to figure out what do they do when they play quarters teams? What's the worst things that we could possibly see in this defense? And so you're going to spend a lot of time on double post on your scissors and how you're going to defend those things and what your answers are. And, and frankly, even if they don't have some of that stuff on film, we're still going to run it every single week because you want to present the guys the worst thing they could possibly see if they run the stuff that the coverage or the pressure should be good against, it's great, but you're trying to give them an idea of how are we going to defend the worst thing we could possibly see within that. So that, that's kind of how we break down what we run in practice. Um, you know, for run game, uh, and actually I'll jump ahead to this one. This would be our run game summary. I don't remember who this is against here, but like if you look at the top box here, this would be their run game out of the two back personnel. And so the big thing here, if you look at the point of attack, you know, 72% of their run plays out of two back are an inside point of attack as opposed to off tackle or on the perimeter. So right away when you're looking at that, you know, seven out of 10 runs are really A to B gap. So now you start looking through your inventory of defensive calls. Okay, what do we have? that puts extra guys in the A or B gap that's going to blow up their likely point of attack. You know, if, if it's their 5R personnel, it's the same thing. You know, it's almost 60% inside point of attack. So 
sometimes there isn't one like their three back stuff is pretty balanced here but when you look at like that two back okay if they have a full back on the field you know if if it's a situation we think they're going to run the ball seven out of ten runs are going to be a to b gap well let's put as many bodies there as possible and we're going to be right more often than not um and then it's the same kind of idea for sorry for pass game this is from a different team here but like if you look at the second set of boxes here, you know, uh, over 50% of their passes in two back are going to be seven man protection. And then the big one here, like where it says R 71 and 71, that one tells us that the running back is going to be the weak side of the formation. So their top two protections out of two back, we know the tailback's going to be to the boundary side that's going to be the man side of their protection. So it makes sense that we want to get into our boundary pressures against that. Cause now we've got a chance to get our best guys, you know, matched up on their worst protector and make that running back have to stay in and protect. Um, and so from a protection standpoint, a lot of the time it boils down to, um, you know, how can we get our best, like we talked about it when we did the pressure stuff, how can we get our best pass rushers matched up on the running back? But the starting point has to be, can we figure out where that running back's going to be in the protection? Yeah, I think the one of the things too, and this almost goes for offensive coaches too. I remember coaching the JV team, and we were running, you know, inside zone power and counter, and we had counter in out of spread, but I don't know if I ran it once in a game in the season because I didn't want the receiver blocking the end on the backside of counter. So it's like, yeah, we had it in, and we would rep it, you know, once or twice in practice. But I'm looking at my tendencies, and like I'm only calling zone read out of five R. You know what I mean? And then when we're in two back, like you're getting, you know, 70% gap scheme. Like I, I forget exactly what our tendency was, but um, it didn't hurt us that year, but I've always looked at that and gone, okay, like you're going to get, if you look at the run scheme, not by personnel or not even by formation, you're going to get one picture. But if you can look at the run scheme by, per, by even personnel, not even formation necessarily, but even just by who's in the game, you can get a lot better idea of, you know, hey, we want to be in this type of, uh, you know, run blitz because we think we're getting zone Will you, or, or this, this type of front we think we're getting zone. You might feel totally differently if you're getting, you know, pullers or, or whatever it is. So I think that's a huge point too, not just looking at, okay, where do they run the ball? That's great. But where do they run the ball to certain personnels or, or what style of run they use, I think can be a big tell. Yeah, I agree. And I think when you – you're trying to get as much information available to you as what you're going to have available in the game. So formation you're going to see, but you don't see it until after you put in the play call, you can have some checks and stuff built in, but every single play call you make, you're going to know the personnel, you're going to know the field zone, you're going to know the down and distance situation. You're trying to get as much info with what you're provided before the play as possible so that you can get into the best set of calls for what you're likely to see out of that. Um, and the, the next one after we do like their base run and pass stuff is we'll look at explosive plays and deep balls. And so like we've talked about this before, but the two most important stats for anybody in winning games is explosive play uh, margin and takeaway margin. Uh, and, and so you, you try to grind really hard on where their where their explosive plays coming from, how are they generating their 20 plus passes and their 15 plus runs the number one job of the secondary is to eliminate deep balls. And so you're trying to make them move the ball down the field um, in as few chunk plays as you possibly can, but you don't want to just be telling the guys get deep, get deep. You want to understand, okay, who are the actual threats to get behind the coverage here? Who do they throw deep balls to? Most teams don't, aren't, aren't going to have four or five guys that they'll throw deep balls to. Um, they're going to have their one or two guys that they feel comfortable putting the ball up deep to and you want to have a good understanding where those guys are. And so when you're looking at explosive plays, you know, who creates them and then how do they get them? Are, are, are they max protecting and taking shots? Are they getting explosive plays just out of their screen game or their six man drop back game, whatever the case is, um, deep balls, you know, things like sudden change affect the likelihood of the ball going up deep are they doing it anywhere on the field are they only doing it on certain field zones you know some offenses if they're backed up on their own goal line they're going to put the ball up deep pretty frequently and someone even touch it they'll just run the ball twice and take a safety 
some teams, as soon as they get across midfield, well, they're going to try to take a shot to put six on the board or get down inside the low red zone. So you're just trying to figure out what their philosophy is and their approach to generating explosives. So again, this is from, I think this would be a Windsor game actually, because based on the numbers, but like, if you look at the explosive plays here, you know, 13 had eight of their explosive plays and the next most on the entire team was four. And then if you look at the deep balls that they threw, well, 13 had 14 targets on what we would consider deep balls, which was half of theirs. And, and the next guy had six. So he's got more than twice as many deep balls as the next guy on the team. So, you know, it, it when you see stuff like that, it, it really just confirms what you see on an initial uh, inspection of the film is 13 is pretty good player. He, he's, the guy who's generating their explosive plays. He's the guy that they want to put the ball up deep to. What are our answers to make sure that we've got, you know, somebody getting hands on having somebody over the top and um, trying to take away that threat as an explosive play weapon downfield. And then the other one we'll spend a little bit of time on is their screen game and their gadget plays. So the gadgets by the end of the week, we'll have watched any that show up on film. And if they do them frequently, we'll look back on the last couple years to and show the guys any gadget plays that have shown up. Um, but like, if you look at the screen breakdown here, you know, 11 other screens to come out of a four by one set, which is again, you know, twice as much as anything else. So if they're in a four by one set, you know, let's guys start thinking about screen and then who are they actually throwing the screens to what field zone and, you're trying to get as good a feel as possible for where they're likely to do it. And then the, the next stuff is probably the more common stuff that I think guys spend a lot of time on. So down the distance tendencies, obviously everybody does. This is a list of, um, you know, just the, the general down and distance situations that we'll break down week to week and talk to the guys about. Um, but anything we do with the players when we get into meetings and stuff that week or when we get into practice, there's always a scenario attached to it. And so, you know, if it, you're not just running plays in practice, but okay, this is a second and five situation. So what are the most likely set of things that they're going to present to us in this situation out of this personnel grouping? And then th these are just like rough ideas of what teams are generally going to do in situations like second and short, second and medium. So things that you're generally looking for, if they stick to that script, which a lot of do, then that's great. So a lot of teams are going to throw their quick passing game or they're going to throw pick and rub routes on second and medium situations. But, you know, you play the odd team that second and four to six is still a heavy rundown. And so if they're doing something that's different from what you would typically see week to week, um, you want to make sure that the guys have an understanding of that and they know what they should be looking for in that situation. So these are just a couple, again, random examples of from different games of things we saw in different situations. So like this possession in 10 situation when this team was in a 5R personnel grouping, you know, over 50% of their plays were naked bootleg or drop back pass. You know, their top play there is fake Zorro Sally, which is a – fake inside zone bootleg for the quarterback. Um, and, and so you've got a pretty good idea. You're going to see the ball in the air if they're come out in five R um, in a new series. And so it, it, maybe that's a little better pressure situation than what it typically would be on a PN 10 when teams are just throwing quick game or, um, you know, a base run on PN 10. Like this is a second and two to three situation. So a second and short situation from another game the mix plays are like we would call RPOs mix in our breakdown. And so they've got seven plays out of five R on second and two to three, six of the seven plays are RPO plays. And so you, you've got a pretty good idea if you end up in this situation in the game that you're going to get RPO. So what are our best RPO answers um, this game? And you're going to have two to three different things that you call in that situation, which is different than, you know, again, to a lot of teams, if it's second and two to three, they're just going to line up and run power inside zone or split zone in a base run scheme and try to pick up the first down. This team, you're defending a different set of circumstances in that situation. You know, this is a second and four to six. The big one that would stand out here is, you know, whether it's five R or two back, they're over 80%. And even in two back, they're 90% pass on second and medium. So, you know, most weeks you're still conscious of run in a second and medium situation, but, 
you know, this team is 85, 90% pass on second and four plus. So now maybe you can take some chances with a lighter box on second and medium, and you're not as worried about defending the run game. How can we get more guys out on the perimeter to defend quick game or screen or whatever it is they're giving us in that situation? And again, this is just a second and long that's pretty standard where they're 90% pass and, you know, most of it is six man drop back pass. So that, that one's pretty standard for what we see most weeks, but you, you're, you're really just trying to go situation by situation with this personnel grouping on the field. You know, what are the couple things that we expect to see? Sometimes you have a tendency, sometimes you don't. Um, but everybody's going to have at least some amount of tendencies and you want to have a, a good understanding of as many of those as you possibly can. Is there anything that you, you know, obviously we've been kind of walking through, you know, lots of information. Is there anything that you would say um, more recently you paid more attention to maybe something like from, you know, whether it's last season or just more recently that has come up that you found is, is helping you understand offenses more, or is it kind of depend on the opponent and, and the year? It, it's both, but I, one of the, I think one of the best things that um, coach Knox shared with me was he, he would spend a lot more time than I previously would grinding on that second and four to six situation. And, and so I had always kind of looked at it as um, like just the bigger picture of second and medium, what are their general run pass? And you see a lot of quick games. So what are our answers for that? But you're really trying to figure out what's the exact number where they will a stop running the ball and then B what's the exact number where they'll stop throwing quick game. And so that bleeds into the second and seven, 10 as well. But some teams, you know, they'll still run the ball on second and four. But if, if you look at second and five plus, it's like 98% pass. And so they don't feel like comfortable that they can get the five consistently. And so the, the second and four to six category is probably the one I've changed the most on in terms of spending a lot more time looking at each specific yardage. And, and I was in, I was kind of blown away when you start going through it um, that with most teams, you can find almost an exact number where they'll stop running the ball. And then, you know, some teams they'll still throw quick game on second and seven, but you won't see any quick game if it's second and eight plus. And, and if you can know that, you know, as much as you're looking at the general situation it helps um, simplify it for the guys, uh, you know, if it's second and nine, that may be very different than second and seven where you could still see quicks and they feel like they can fall forward to get the extra yard. Um, but they don't feel as good about that on second and eight. And now you're going to see drop back pass. So spending more time on those medium yardage situations and really breaking it down yard by yard to get a good understanding of how the offensive coordinator looks at each specific yardage, I think is one way that we, we've changed more recently for sure. Yeah, I think that's, that, that's an interesting, you know, and I think back to some of my experience too, you know, as an offensive guy, there's definitely, it, whether it's areas of the field or, you know, uh, when we talk about, you know, whether it's second and four, you know, to second and, to second and seven or eight, it changes too, I guess, like how much, how you want to pressure that team. Like if they're not going to run quick game, you can look at that really differently than, Hey, we might get quick game. We might get inside zone. You know, I think that that's something I hadn't thought about as much. Cause I think most people kind of lump that into like, you know, anything goes in second and six, right? Like you could get inside zone, quick game, some vertical, you know, whereas I, the more I think about it as an offensive guy, you're right. Like there are definitely certain numbers, like each week you go into the game going, you know, hey, we ran the ball pretty well. We feel good on third down. Let's push that number back a bit. Um, but for the most part, you're, you know, you can really change, I think, what you do on defense. If you know that there's some element, whether it's there's no drop back or there's no run game or there's it's not you're going to get vertical pass or draw. You know what I mean? If you can find those numbers, I think it changes a lot for you. Yeah, and I, one of the big goals, I think, is you're just trying to eliminate threats as you go along, right? So – in no situation, if they're worth the salt, are you ever getting hundred percenters, but you're getting, you know, frequent things, you know, two or three things that you can expect to see if on second and six, you have to defend, worry about honoring run quick game 
you know, drop back pass. But then on second and seven, you don't have to worry about run or quick game and you can just focus on drop back pass. It, 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 oh, it frees you up to do a lot of things that you maybe wouldn't if you still had those other threats. And so I, I yeah. think that was a pretty revealing one when we kind of delved into it. Um, the next one, again, is pretty common. So just looking at backfield set tendencies and really what's the alignment of the running back tell us. And sometimes, you know, it, it's interesting in Canadian football. Sometimes this is super relevant, sometimes not at all. Some teams will start the back in pistol every single play and then motion them at the last second. So you're not getting a really good indicator of what you're going to see. And then some teams, they'll still have the static offset gun. Um, but then sometimes the back is in pistol. Like this was one week where, the backfield set was super relevant for us. Um, You know, if you look at the two offset categories there, so gun weak and gun strong, they're both right around 80% pass. If you look at the two categories where the tailback was in the home position, so pistol and under center, you know, now it totally flips and they're much more run heavy if the tailbacks lined up behind the quarterback. So some weeks that's a really relevant one, some weeks it isn't. You know, even with the idea of starting the back in pistol and then motioning him at the last second, you know, if he doesn't do a good job getting up, he's maybe not in as good a spot to protect and those type of things. So there's a trade-off for the offensive guys too. But some weeks like this one in particular was a super relevant week for us of where the running back was going to be. And you see it a lot with like RPO teams and stuff too is some teams don't feel comfortable running – RPOs with the running back in pistol they want them offset because it's an easier look for the quarterback easier easier for the quarterback to have vision on the defender they're keying with the running back offset but then some teams are starting to run RPOs out of pistol and so you, you're just you're trying to figure out if you can get anything off the set of the back in terms of what the likely threats are and, and then the next one this is really what we spend the most amount of time on and this is what we, we really try to hammer with the guys and we'll spend the most amount of prep time on in terms of what calls we want to be in is our hit charts. And so really we're just looking at every formation that they've presented on film and the games that we break down. And you're just trying to figure out where are they attacking on the field out of each formation, where are their best players going to line up and then the, how are they attacking our defense or a defense with a similar structure out of um, each formation. So you know, if you're a team that runs the halfback over, a team that gets into three by one is going to have um, a, a specific set of things that they like to do out of their three by one formation against the team that travels the halfback over. That's going to be a totally different set of things that they, than they would do out of three by one against the team that would, you know, apex the Sam and keep the half tied to the box. And so, you really want to hone in out of each formation. How are they likely to attack us? What are the biggest threats and what calls do we need to to be in to take that away? Um, And so we'll go through, I'll show a couple examples in a second, but we'll go through each one of the hit charts and we'll put them up on the board. And, you know, if it's a formation that shows up frequently in the breakdown, here's the threats. Now we need to have four or five answers for how we're going to take this away. You know, if it's slightly less frequent, maybe you'll need two to three. If it's a formation they've only run a couple times, then you're maybe good with just having one answer to that formation. Um, But you're trying to get a good picture of how they're going to attack the defense out of each formation. So this is an example of one of our hit charts. You know, this is a two by three formation. They ran 41 times in our breakdown. And so, Again, all the relevant stuff is highlighted, you know, so out of this two by three set, they're 83% pass. So it's a super pass heavy look for them. The big thing that would jump out as we look through this, you know, these are their receiver targets out of the formation. So if you look at their number one and number two strong, you know, they've got 13 and seven targets respectively, and nobody else on the field has more than three. So for us, when we look at this, the, the first thing we're going to do is, okay, if they get into a two by three, they want to throw the ball to the field. What coverages do we have where we can get three over two to the field and take away, um, you know, what they want to do or what, where they want to throw the ball out of that formation. You know, maybe they bring their best players over to the field as well. I don't remember which game this is from, but um, like it, it's a pretty clear picture of what they're trying to accomplish, at least in the passing game out of that two by three set. And then, you know, down here would be 
the different pass zones on the field. So short, strong, short, medium, short, weak, and so on. So if you look at this, they've got, you know, they threw the ball nine times, short, strong, six times, intermediate, strong, and then nothing else is over two or three. So right away, again, we're going to look at what are our coverage answers for this. They're in it 41 times, so it's, a, it's at least a decent part of what they do. So you can't just say, okay, we're just going to run this coverage against two by three. The good offenses are going to have answers when you take that away. So, you know, you maybe need three different answers for how you can take away that field or the throws to the field um, out of two by three to feel comfortable with it. And then this is, a, again, the same set, so a two by three set. But now this is a completely different picture, right? Their field receivers have zero targets and two targets but then their three boundary receivers have 14, nine, and 10. If you look at their pass zones here, at pretty much everything is to the, to the boundary side, and they actually didn't have a single pass to the strong side of the field. So now it, the, the coverages that we're gonna put on film against the two by three set that week are going to be entirely different. Now everything's gotta be rotated into the boundary, and we're trying to figure out how can we get four over three. Maybe you're comfortable just leaving two for two to the field and playing even numbers there, but it's the same formation, but the things that you're trying to defend out of it are completely different. And then this is, I mean, this is a relevant one as well as this is where they're running the ball, right? So these are to the strong side. These are to the boundary side of the field. You know, 10 of their 16 runs here are inside weak. So again, you start looking at pressures. If we want to pressure, how, how can we bring inside pressure to the boundary side? Because that's the likely point of attack. And so you're just, you're trying to figure out again, where's the ball most likely to go? What do they want to do out of this formation? This team clearly wants to attack to the short side of the field. So what, what are our answers going to be and how can we take that away? And then these are, again, same kind of thing. This is a two by two set now with the fullback offset strong. So again, this team, in terms of their pass game is heavily favored the boundary side. So 16 and 11 targets and then the field side, not nearly as much, you know, the difference here now with the fullback on the field. Now there's a lot more off tackle run than those last couple sets that we broke down. But again, you can see like looking at where the ball's actually going in the pass game, almost everything is favoring the weak side of the field. And the last one I'll show here for, the hit charts again this is a two by two set against a different team but again flip picture in terms of what you're defending now again this team out of two by two they were throwing the ball to the one and two strong and there's a huge tendency to favor the field side so now that that's a completely different set of coverages that we're going to want to be in that week so again I, I think all you're trying to do is get a good picture of where are they trying to run the ball where are they trying to throw the ball what coverages, pressures, fronts, et cetera, do we have that are going to uh, attack the likely point of attack or make sure that we've got extra bodies wherever they're trying to throw the ball. Like if you look at the run game here, again, two by two with the fullback week, they didn't run the ball to the strong side of the field a single time. Everything was off tackle week or outside week. So now, you know, you're looking at this and you're thinking edge pressure from the boundary looks really, really good because we can blow up the off tackle area. We can blow up the perimeter area to the boundary side, and we can still keep enough guys to the field um, to cover their most likely passing, passing threat. So, you know, it, it seems like a lot of information. It takes time on the uh, data entry for sure. And we're fortunate enough at extra bodies to help with that part of it. But, you know, even at the high school level, you're going to see fewer formations likely and probably even greater tendency. So if you can have a really good picture of where the ball is likely to go out of every formation and you can communicate that to the defense and have a way to get them into, you know, pretty advantageous calls for it, um, it, it can make it a lot more difficult on what offenses are trying to do against you. Yeah, I think that's, that's where, you know, the rubber meets the road kind of. You may not have the ability to do all of this, but you're also probably looking at, less data points for each in each situation right less plays less amounts of games you know less formations less personnel so it's all about finding what works for you that's huge mm -hmm. and I, th I think the other big one there when you're looking at defense is just th there's not a 
there's not a cure all coverage or pressure or anything you, you and that's where it gets into debate about how much to do and you know a lot of guys will rely on the we're just going to do a couple things and make sure our kids play fast but that's going to limit you in situations where you you need to have multiple answers to take away what a certain offense is doing and so you want to make sure you've got enough in that you've got answers for the various things that you're going to see and that that's where it relies on the teaching aspect of it is how can we do this in a really uh learnable way for our kids how can we communicate to them so that they understand that they understand what they're trying to do and even when you're installing stuff, if you put a coverage in in training camp, it can't just be this is a coverage. It's got to be this is this coverage. Here's the strengths and weaknesses of it. So we may not run this for three weeks, but now all of a sudden when we see a team that likes to throw the ball to two strong out of a three by two on second down, well, we're going to run this a bunch. And the guys understand we're running this because we want to take away, you know, the, the intermediate pass to two strong. And you're trying to, convey that understand make sure that they ha understand why you're calling it in different situations and makes it easier for them to problem solve on the fly um, the, the, the last couple here that we'll break down just go quick through these but we would break down again like field zone tendencies so these are the field zones that we'll use so the the big ones like backed up you're trying to figure out what do they like to do in backed up situations? So again, most teams are either going to run the ball twice and if they don't pick up a first down, give up a safety, or are they a team that likes to take a shot? They figure they've got to make like eight or nine first downs to get a score. That's probably not going to happen. So it's worth the gamble to, uh, you know, max protect, take a home run shot. And if it doesn't pay off, we'll just give up the safety anyway. So you're, you're trying to prepare your guys for what they're going to see in that situation. Backed up's a big one because it's points. And so it's a scoring opportunity for the defense. And so you want to spend time on it because if you can go to and out there, it's going to put points on the board for you. High red zone, low red zone, again, we'll spend a lot of time on. Again, these are basic rules for what you're going to see from most offenses in those situations, but there's going to be weeks where it's different. And then the other big one is, you know, most teams – they're running their core plays in their own end, but when they get across midfield, so the turn zone or the fringe zone, a lot of teams, that's where they like to take their shot. You know, if not many teams will take as many shots backed up in their own end, because even if they complete it, they still may not be in scoring range and they want to get points out of it. Once they get across midfield, teams start to think, okay, if we complete a deep ball here, it's potentially a touchdown or we're at least guaranteed a field goal. So that's where they want to take their shot or, you know, it, it, if they're a team that likes to run a lot of gadget plays, that's where they're more likely to do it. They're not going to run it in their own end. So you're just trying to give the guys a picture of what do we want to be alert for in these different field zones. And sometimes you don't have much, but sometimes there's some pretty good tells on teams of what you're going to see. The other one that will break down is, um, you know, game situation. So like two minute, what are their top pass plays when they need to throw the ball to the sideline and stop the clock? And it's a little different in Canadian football because of the clock rules, but you still want to know like what are their go-to pass concepts in two minute when they're behind, you know, what's their top runs in four minutes. So when they're trying to run out the clock and we've got to get off the field in two plays, what run plays do they feel most comfortable in and what are our best answers for those to make sure that we get stops when we need them? What's their philosophy in sudden change? So are they a team when they get a turnover on defense, are they always going to try to take a shot and try to catch the defense sleeping? Are they going to run their base offense? Two point plays got to have a plays is one that, you know, you, you asked about stuff that we spent more time on recently and that's definitely one. And it helped us in a, for sure two games this year is you want to break down the, the, the key situations that you see week to week. So like third and three, like where a team's got to convert, what are they calling? And you can usually get a couple of those uh, on film and you start to get a feel for what are they going to do in a situation where they absolutely need to pick up a first down and they absolutely need to have a good play. To your point, a lot of offensive guys, their philosophy is going to be players, not plays. So it's going to be something that gets the ball to their best player, but sometimes it's not the case and they have certain plays that they like in that situation. You're just trying to figure out like, if there's a critical situation that we find ourselves in the game, what are they likely to call? Um, and again, like you're spending, it, it's a limited, 
it's a limited set of situations you're actually going to be in in a game, but they're critical ones. So it's worth the time investment to have a good understanding of what you're going to see when they have to have a play. And then reactive play calling for us is just, this is something we mostly keep with the coaches. We don't really give to the players except for the odd one, but scouting, what are they going to do? Or what, what did they like to call after an explosive play? after a negative play, after they pick up, you know, two first downs, those type of things. And, you know, like a lot of offensive coordinators, they'll have a rule like after two first downs, you know, that's a good drive. So now we're going to take a shot. Um, some offenses, if they take a negative play on first down, they get super conservative on their next play. Some teams, if they create an explosive play, now they're going to take a shot on the next play and try to double up and catch you still trying to figure stuff out from the previous plan. Again, some weeks relevant, some weeks not, but it it, it is there offensive coordinators again are creatures that have been, so you can usually get a pretty good idea of how they're gonna follow up certain situations that come up. So th those are the big ones that we'll give our players in the scouting report. And then this is just kind of a look at how we structure our week in terms of um the coaches learning about it and then conveying that information and practicing it with the players. You know, so it, this assumes that we have a game on Saturday. You know, Sunday we would review the score goals and the, the film from the previous game and start working on our next opponent. Monday is when we distribute the scouting reports that I just went through to the players. And so we would spend, you know, all day Sunday making sure all the data is in there. We have everything filled in with the scouting report. And then when we meet with the players, we don't practice on Monday, but we would meet with them and you're giving them kind of a – like a personality profile of that opponent offense. So here's the best players. Here's their core stuff that we're going to see this week. This is what their identity is. And you want them to start to have a base understanding of what they're going to see. Um, you know, Tuesday and Wednesday are big practice days. So I kind of put in brackets there what situations we would work on. So again, we're not going through every single situation with the guys at the beginning of the week. We're doing it kind of piecemeal as the week goes on. You know, so that Tuesday practice, we're just working on first down. We're doing our short yardage and goal line because that's our most uh, heavy contact day of the week. And then we start to do some of the high red zone stuff. The other thing that I put in there, you know, our coaches are always a day ahead of the players. And so if, if Monday, sorry, if Tuesday's practice is first down and short yardage goal line, all day Tuesday, we're actually working on second down and low red zone because we did their first down and short yardage goal line stuff on Monday. And so the coaches are always a day ahead in terms of the prep and the players are always a day ahead in looking at the film. So when they show up to practice that day, they've already looked at, you know, the first down cut ups and they have a good understanding of what we're going to be working in. Um, and then, you know, we, we have a flipped end of the week. So we do our walkthrough Thursday and we have our last practice Friday, as opposed to doing the walkthrough on Friday. One thing that we started this year, um, that I, I thought was a gigantic help and our players gave really positive feedback on is we do our walkthrough Thursday and earlier that day, we'll have a meeting with all the defensive starters and all the key, key subs. So guys who are going to play a considerable number of snaps within the game, whether they're rotational D linemen or, you know, extra DBs who are going to play in sub packages, whatever. And we, we just print off, you know, our ready list for the game and we'll go through with them every single call that we have in against the personnel groupings and field zones and the situations that we like it in. And that meeting is really an opportunity for the guys to com communicate if there's anything in the game plan they're not comfortable with. Um, and so we'll never add anything at that meeting. Everything's done by Wednesday. But if in that Thursday meeting, there's stuff as we go through the ready list that they don't feel comfortable with or understand. We'll just take it out of the game plan for the rest of that week. And then Friday, we're only repping the calls that our guys have said they feel comfortable with and have a good understanding of what they're trying to do and execute. And so we only started doing that this past season uh, because we flipped it, but I, I thought it was a huge help because you do find out, you do find out in that meeting that there's some things that you just haven't done a good enough job explaining or communicating to the guys throughout the week, or there's just stuff that, you know, you've ran it for two days in practice and it just still doesn't look good on film. 
And so why are we trying to force this if we've got, you know, four or five other answers that cover us in this area? So I, I thought that was a really beneficial um, uh, meeting that we added. Um, I found it helpful to me because it does give you really good feedback from the guys. And it also makes them feel like they've got ownership of the defense. Um, and and uh, they're, they're taking control of what you're actually doing on game day, having input in the game plan. They, they feel like they've got strong ownership of the product out on the field as well. Yeah, it's amazing. I love that. I love that concept. Yeah. And then, um, you know, after that, the, the last two things I'm going to talk about here. So first of all, this is how we, we structure kind of our film watching with the players and coaches. And so this is the same, whether it's coaches or players. Um, and, and this takes instruction. Like you have to teach the guys how to watch film. You, a lot of guys, I think, take the approach just telling them to watch film without giving them specific instructions on how they should be watching film and what to watch. So I, I think it's important to coach the guys on what their film prep should look like. And that that's not just what to watch, but you know how to watch. So one of the things we'll talk to the guys about is you should be verbalizing all the calls that you're going to make on the field while you're watching film and you're verbalizing all the things that you're expecting to see. So like by the end of the week, you know, if I'm a defensive back watching film, pause it, you know, it, what's the situation? Where are they on the field? It's second and eight. They're in five R. It's a three by two set. What are the top three pass concepts that I'm looking for in this situation as a boundary corner? And they say it out loud so they, they're accountable to it. And then you watch the play. And by the end of the week, you should be hitting on, you know, 75, 80% of the calls that you're going to see. And if you do that, you feel really comfortable that you're ready. Um, but at the start of the week, on Sunday, we'll watch the last three games for sure from start to finish, as well as any previous games that we have in the breakdown against us. And so the first time we go through the film, you're not – necessarily locked in on any one specific thing or watching specific situations, but that's where you're just trying to get um, a feel for the flow of the game, understanding the personality of the offense and what they're trying to accomplish, you know, seeing who the best players are. Is there like a really dynamic guy who's consistently making plays, that type of thing. Generally, you know, how are they doing against blitz? How are they doing against just four man rush or three man rush coverage, that type of thing. You know, you're making general notes about, okay, that's the third time I've seen them take a shot when they get across midfield. You know, I've seen them run two gadgets this game now. So general things like that. But the first viewing, you, you, you're really just trying to pay attention to the flow of game and generally what they're doing on offense. After we do that, the rest of the time, Sunday through Wednesday, we're watching specific cutups. And so, you know, if it's Sunday or sorry, if it's Monday night, and we're doing first down the next day, then the guys need to be going through that first down cut up. And what are they trying to do on first down out of various personnel groupings and formations? You have your hit charts open in front of you. So maybe you're watching all the, the plays out of the two by three set, right? And you're confirming and making notes on your hit chart of what you're going to see. Um, for us, again, like if you're seeing certain formations over and over, you need to have multiple answers for it. You can't just rely on one. If there's one offs, then you can be good with just one answer. Now you're starting to get into the, the finer detail of, okay, I'm going to watch their top 10 pass concepts. You know, maybe on these two pass concepts, there's a huge difference with the split of the receiver on the field. So if that receiver lines up closer to the formation, here's the two pass concepts they're going to run out of this look. So now you start to get, into the alignment and the split and the tendencies that um, you're going to communicate to the guys that alert them to certain things coming up. Um, but I think it's important not just to tell the guys to watch film, but they've got a specific purpose every single night of the week. Here are the cutups that I need to be watching because this is what I'm going to see in practice the next day. And we always talk to the guys, like if it's Tuesday practice, we get one day to rep first down and high red zone and short yardage and goal line situations. You can't show up to practice on Tuesday. You're seeing the short yardage stuff for the first time because you haven't watched on film. You make a bunch of mistakes. We don't necessarily get to come back to that again. We might get another rep or two at the very end of the week on Friday. Um, you want the guys to have watched it the night before so they have a good understanding of what they're going to see they can ask questions in meeting the next day and we'll review the stuff that, 
you know, we've identified as key um, to the players before that practice so we can utilize the practice time. But you're trying to make sure that you maximize the amount of time you are on the field as much as possible. And then Thursday to Friday, and I said, I think this is one of the things that I feel really good about in terms of helping us and helping our student athletes prepare for game day. When we get to Thursday, Friday, now we're going back through previous games again, and we're not watching the cutups anymore. We're watching the game as it's in progress, but you're stopping the play. Um, you know, you're stopping the play before the ball snapped every single play. You're looking at the D and D you're looking at the field zone. You're looking at the game situation and you're verbalizing out loud, what am I going to see here? And like, I'll sit in my office Thursday and Friday and do exactly that. Our players, you know, if they're watching film at home, they'll sit in their room and they're verbalizing the stuff that they're expecting to see. And if you've done a good job with your prep, you should be hitting on like easily 70% of the stuff that you're going to see in each situation. And it, the, the level of confidence that that builds with the players that they're prepared and ready, I, I think does translate over to game day. And then the absolutely. last, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, absolutely. I think that that concept of when you're, when you're watching film, being able to, you know, consciously recognize, you know, these three pieces of information tell me this, you know, this change in split means I'm not going to get that, but I'm more likely to get this. Like those are the tangible, you know, when you look at the big, you know, thousand foot view of game planning to, okay, what do my players use in the two seconds before, the receiver hits the line of scrimmage or the ball snapped. It's those pieces of information that they've identified that help them. Yeah. And it's like you said, it's a very finite amount of time that you have to process a lot of information before the snap. And especially in Canadian football with the motion rules where things can change very, very quickly. Um, and so it's like anything else you want the guys, it's all reps but you can't do all the reps on the field, but you can get meaningful reps of working through that thought process on your own, watching film in your room or in meetings. The way you maximize that time is you're actually verbalizing these things. And the more that you do that, the easier it does get. And so now, even though it seems like a lot of information, you can actually process all that different stuff that's available to you in the two to three seconds that you have before the snap. But you don't just show up to game day and are able to do that. It takes a lot of lead time on the front end and a lot of prep work to actually be able to get confident at it. Um, and then the last piece that I've put in here, you know, on game day is kind of an extension of the prep week. And so one of the, the great things that I read um, was kind of a breakdown of how to approach a game in terms of quarters. And so th this is, how we like to think about is that that first quarter it is really about evaluation. And so the big question you're trying to answer in the first quarter is, is this what we saw on film or not? And most weeks it is, but sometimes it's a pretty drastic departure, but all you're trying to see is, you know, are our tendencies holding up? Are the things that we identified that they're going to do in these situations, is this still what they're doing against us? Or are they doing something totally different that we didn't spend as much time on? You know, are they doing certain run concepts or pass concepts more or less? And we've got a couple of coaches in the booth charting all this stuff by personnel and the Indian field zone. And you're, you're in constant dialogue about those. Um, but I, I think the big question that you want to have answered by the end of the first quarter is, is this what we prepared for on film? Like the semifinal game against Guelph is a great example is, you know, the first two drives, it's the same. But then after that, it's pretty dramatically different from anything they had put on film the rest of the year. And so now you, you've got to start thinking about what your adjustments are going to be. Um, the second and third quarter, like people talk about halftime adjustments, but it's an ongoing thing. And it's not waiting until halftime. But the second and third quarter is now where you are making your adjustments. And so now you've evaluated what you're seeing. You've got a good understanding of how they're trying to attack you. And so now you're playing the game as it goes is okay. If, if this is what we saw on film and this is what we prepared for, here was our plan a, you know, is that working or not? Do we need to go to plan B? And like, again, one of the, an, another great thing that um, was something that Greg shared with me that I thought was brilliant is like, if you look at the run game, for example, okay, we we've identified, we need to stop the run this week. 
you can't just say, here's how we're going to stop the run. It's here's how we want to stop the run so that we can still cover down on the receiving threats we need to worry about. Here's our plan B when plan A isn't good enough to stop the run and we can't hold up with that. And then what's our plan C when plan B still sucks? And now what are we going to do when we absolutely have to stop the run and nothing else is working? And so, you know, you have to have kind of three layers to your thought process there of, what do we want to do? So it helps us with everything that we have to worry about. And then what are we going to do when we absolutely have to get a stop and nothing else is working. And so if you've talked about that stuff ahead of time, you've talked about it with the players, they understand here's the next thing that we're going to go through or go to uh, if plan A is not working. And, and it's important to have that because you don't always know how you match up. Um, you have thoughts and some weeks you feel better than others, but there is a level of uncertainty going into it until you actually see the guys on game day and how they match up, you know, in specific areas against your opponent. And then if, if they are doing something that's dramatically different, I think that's one of the reasons that we advocate for installing quite a bit in camp is you always want to have, um, you always want to have stuff in your back pocket that you can go to. And so you're practicing certain coverages or pressures the whole season. You might not call them for a couple of weeks, but you still rep them a little bit in practice so that if you do get in a situation where you need it, you've actually still got something to go through. Um, and again, like, I think that's one place we've got better at is, you know, a few years ago, it, it, our success will probably would have been more dictated by was the game plan good. I think one place we've got better is, um, you know, keeping extra stuff available to us and teaching a lot earlier on in camp so that, you know, like the York game this year was a great example. York's offense was uh, like, they, they weren't letting us do certain things that we wanted to get into and they weren't doing certain things that we had prepped against through the week. They were throwing a lot more perimeter screens and that type of stuff and not letting us get into our pressure game. And so, the stuff that we had spent most of the week working on, you know, it went by the wayside pretty quickly, like partway through the first quarter. And now you're into a totally different set of calls than what you really spent most of your practice time on that week. And the only way you can be successful in that circumstance is that you rep that stuff the whole year. And then, you know, once it gets to the fourth quarter, now you're really honing in on each specific situation. So now the clock's a big factor. The scoreboard's a big factor and, every single drive is unique. So again, you've done your prep for two minute and four minute and the game situations. Now the play calling may be different because they're playing three down football. And so if they're behind, you know, a, a second and seven situation when you know that you've got three downs available to you versus a standard second and seven is totally different. Um, so you have to be aware of that. And the fourth quarter, I think the most important thing, like, one, quarter one through three we're communicating with the guys like here's what they're doing here's what our adjustments are here's what we need to do to counter this and making sure they have a good understanding of how the opponent's trying to attack us once we get into the fourth quarter that's all really out the window the fourth quarter is really about communicating to the guys on the sideline here's what the next situation is going to be so you're trying to tell them, okay, now with this amount of time left in the game, you know, um, they'll still run the ball and run their base offense in this situation. Maybe two minutes later is when they've shown on film. Now they're going to, you know, they're two scores behind at this point. Now they're throwing the ball every single play. So now the defensive line doesn't need to worry about defending run on first down. Now they're getting into their best pass rush stance and you're, you're you're just trying to convey to them what situation they're going into. They're likely to go hurry up here. You know, they're going to no huddle the rest of the way. So the call is going to come quickly and, you know, remind them that they got to run back to the line of scrimmage and get set and get their eyes to the sideline as quickly as they can, because the calls are going to come quick. And the, the fourth quarter is very much um, situational football and communicating that to the guys. Um, so yeah, that's, all, that's what I got for you there. Yeah, that's awesome, Coach. And, and, you know, I really appreciate, you know, the, the detail and the amount of time, you know, you put into that presentation. I'll make sure to link the first presentation as well, um, you know, to this one when I put it out. So, you know, thanks very much. And, you know, even if you're an offensive coach looking at that, you know, you th there's a lot of things to think about, I think, in terms of, hey, like, this is the level of preparation that, you know, people are able to put in 
you know, in, in your practice, you know, whether you're on offense or defense or your head coach or you're trying to, you know, beg, borrow, and steal some of this stuff for your program. I think there's a lot of different things people can take from that. So I really appreciate your time. No problem. Thanks for having me, Jackson.